Hello and welcome to a book talk with Alessia Hromichuk, who is the author of a new book out with Ibidem Verlag, uh, A Loss, the story of a dead soldier told by his sister. Um, it's written by Alessia, who is a writer and historian, and it takes uh, a very difficult and personal path through uh, the war in Ukraine, which has been happening since 2014 and has cost uh, thousands of lives and um, many displaced persons. Uh, Alessia, Alessia's book, uh, as you'll find out, um, deals with your grief over the death of your brother Volodya and um, I think is possibly the most powerful book about the war in Ukraine today. Uh, Alessia, I'd like to start with uh, a fairly direct but important question. Could you tell us about Volodya and what happened to him? Yes, uh, Volodya is my eldest brother. Uh, he was 42 at the time uh, of his death uh, at the front line in 2017. Um, he volunteered to uh, join the Ukrainian armed forces in 2015 and um, spent nearly two years uh, fighting um, as a soldier of the Ukrainian armed forces in the Donbass. Um, and he was killed at the front line in March. Uh, 2017. Vlodya is a, um, a very interesting character. He meant a lot uh, to me um, when he was alive. He was always larger than life. Um, we remember him as a soldier now, but I also remember him as, um, as an artist, uh, as a traveler, as uh, an eccentric, um, a really fun and complicated person to be with <laughs> and, and and someone who left a, a huge gap in my life um, and that's essentially what i try to discuss in the book i try to make sense of this big loss of my brother um, for me and for my family and i also try to make sense of the war as uh, an individual who was affected by by this war in such a profound way, as someone who lives really far away uh, from the front line, uh, abroad in complete safety, essentially, but whose life nevertheless was completely changed by this war. And also, I suppose, as a historian who studies this war professionally and studies political violence more generally professionally, who studies militarization professionally too, um, and um, yeah, and all of these, um, and as a woman, uh, and as a civilian, uh, and all of these voices come together in this book, um, in, in the strange tapestry. <laughs> I think that's a really good description of the book. Um, when you read it, you, you do see um, these kind of different ways of looking at the world and um, the ways in which you're grappling with what these different ways of being in the world are, are showing you and your attempt to kind of make sense of, um, of all those uh, lenses, shall we say. As you've just said, you're a historian, including of, of military history, and particularly the 20th century. Um, and you talk actually in the book about your own kind of academic study of conflict, um, including in Ukraine, and the way in which, to an extent, I mean, and you will correct me, to an extent perhaps shaped your mourning the experience of grief uh, in that way. Could you say a few words about? Could you say a few words about that? Yes, um, the, the, there are two sides to um, to sort of me trying to uh, come to terms with me as an academic, as a historian, and me as as a sister of of a a, a soldier who was killed at the front line, um, and and one of those is the. Uh, I wrote very critically about militarization. I um, wrote critically as well about instrumentalization of history for the purposes of militarization right from the start of this conflict. I mean, th this is what I discuss in my academic work. Um, and Open Democracy has published some of those articles, which, which was wonderful, really. That was also me trying to understand how I respond as a, uh, as a historian to, to this conflict, a new conflict that happens in the middle of Europe, really. I mean, something that n nobody expected. Um, but I also um, was quite critical of the fact that um, the state seems to have taken, uh, seemed to have taken at the start of the conflict, um, a, a sort of back seat and allowed the volunteers, civil society, to um, look after the army. 
uh, especially in the first months and years of, of the conflict, um, to secure provisions, to buy um, equipment, to buy uniforms, boots and everything else. And I remember talking to my friends who were really actively involved in these volunteer movements and saying, look, you're, you're doing the job of the state. Uh, and I felt reluctant to support uh, some of these. Uh, I uh, really admired these volunteer efforts, but I felt reluctant to, to engage uh, with them um, so closely myself because I felt like we're just allowing the state not to deal with corruption in the army and elsewhere um, by essentially doing the job of the state. Right? And then my brother volunteers and goes to the front and he says, well, it would be really good to have a decent pair of boots, uh, army boots, which were not available um, um, in Ukraine at the time. It would be nice to have good uniform in which I won't be freezing um, uh, in, the, you know, in Donbass, in, in the trench, in, in, in the middle of Ukrainian winter. Um, and of course, what do I do? I go online and I start buying all of these things, just as my friends volunteers did for, for the whole year before that. Um, and so I had this conflict. On the one hand, I did not change my principles. I did not change the way I viewed um, the system. But if you know that the Silox sachet, the uh, medication that can prevent heavy bleeding, is likely to save your brother's life or that of his comrade, then you're going to go online and buy it, and you're going to send it as quickly as possible. So there was that conflict I had to deal with. I understood that I can be right and wrong at the same time. I can still have the same principles, but in practice, the war does something to you where you have to act differently. Um, and the other tension that I felt uh, was um, uh, related to my own vulnerability. So I taught war, I wrote, wrote on war, um, and suddenly I became so vulnerable um, uh, thinking about it. I, as well as being an academic who studies this, I became a sister and people started to uh, learn about the fact that I am a sister of, of, of a soldier who died and I did not want to be perceived as such necessarily in a professional environment and I didn't know what to do with that vulnerability. Um, it was really quite difficult for me to find ways of uh, managing um, anxiety of speaking at conferences, of uh, um, you know not being perceived as a token sister, essentially. And I think the way I tried to come to terms with it, I'm not sure if I fully managed to come to terms with it, is to understand that vulnerability is there, it's important, and we can channel it uh, in, in such a way that helps us talk about this really complex um, war in ways that will will speak to people will in ways that might be understood i mean from from a reader's point of view uh i can definitely say that um i think this is the most powerful book i've ever read about um the war in donbass um and i think i mean it's hard to explain you know just how powerful it is but you know one of you know, certainly one of the reasons as a reader is that, um, you know, you do, sh you, are sh you are showing this vulnerability and you are, you are showing to readers your search for, or, you know, path through this, um, this system. Uh, and you're not, you're not trying to kind of, I don't know, gloss over anything, shall we say, from a personal point of view. Um, and I think that's what kind of gives it to power and that's what gives it to humanity because you not only learn about your journey, obviously you learn about your brother, Volodya, and you also show how, I think it's fair to say, a complex um, person he was. Uh, and obviously you're kind of reacting against, you know, various uh, pressures perhaps there, but I think obviously there is an attempt, you know, a tendency, and, it, and it's not a judgment to call it so, but a tendency towards heroization. Um, of soldiers and I think well, you, know, you read the book and you come out on the other end and you think well I'm not sure whether hero is a, an appropriate term but I have full sympathy for this man and his experience. That's very kind of you to say. It was very important for me to um, to introduce this sort of r real human dimension of a soldier because it was particularly painful to um, read obituaries um, that were written about my brother uh, because he, I, I found it difficult to, to recognize him um, in those obituaries. Um, 
because the text created a hero, a hero who uh, left comfortable, lovely life in uh, Western Europe, and, and he did used to live in, in, in the Netherlands, that's true, um, and then rushed to the front to defend his motherland. And that just wasn't his story. And I felt that telling the human story, the real story, um, should help potentially other soldiers uh, who are servicemen and women who are fighting at the front to recognize themselves um, in those stories because you know if they read heroic versions on your fallen soldiers they might not recognize their own lives and then it's a question of well, what do we value do we value human life regardless um, of you know of the heroic or lack of heroic aspects in it um, or do we not or do we, or do we only value those soldiers who, who leave comfortable lives and rush to the front right the, um, so, so these are the questions for us as society to answer uh, and, and it was very important for me to, to, to speak about my brother in the most honest open way possible in order to not create some kind of myths around him no, I think, um, I mean, you know, when I finished the book, I felt as if, you know, I had to put it practically every, every soldier deserves that kind of treatment. Um, and I think that's, you know, as I said, one of the powerful parts of the book, which is, you know, you read it and you, the, the kind of humanity, you know, its complexity just, just kind of comes through so strongly. Um, your book is probably one of the few kind of extensive or at length accounts of what it means to lose somebody um, in the war in Donbass. Do you think it's going to change the kind of narrative around what's going on there and the people who are involved? I did not write it to to change the narrative necessarily. I, I don't think so. I, I suppose I, I wrote it for a number of reasons. Um, and, and I really hope that it resonates with others who are grieving. And there are so many of us now in Ukraine and outside of Ukraine. Um, already 14,000 lives were lost in this conflict. Uh, that maybe people can, can recognize um, some of the stages of grief in, uh, that they are experiencing through my book. I also hope that um, it um, explains a little bit uh, the war in Donbass through very universal uh, experiences of loss and grief. Uh, because I think especially in the West, um, a lot of people don't know that the war is still ongoing. It's already seven years now. They don't understand um, the complexity of it um, and um, it's difficult to explain the complexity of it as well but I think through this um, universal language of loss um, and a personal tragedy uh, I'm hoping that I will um, explain at least some of the specificity about this conflict in, in Donbass. Um, also, I suppose if, if it's, um, I've translated it into Ukrainian and I'm hoping to publish it in Ukrainian as well. Um, I, I hope that perhaps in, in Ukrainian version, it'll tell a slightly different story. It'll tell a story um, of a person that lives really far away from the front line, um, but is still absolutely profoundly affected by this war. You describe um, your brother Volodya um, in great detail in the book, um, but he's not the only person or character in it. There are also these other people who kind of accompany you on your journey, uh, whether it's in the military commissariat or in the registration office, or even a man, um, a former soldier drinking beer in the military cemetery in Lviv. Was it important to you to describe these people with equal depth as your brother? Absolutely. When we think about war histories, we tend to think about the front line. We think about the trenches, some kind of military equipment, guns, um, uniforms, that kind of stuff. And of course, all of that is, is part of the story of war, but the war affects the entire society. And I think for me, it was really important to give the civilian story of this conflict and also the civilian, the experience of, of a civilian of loss um, in, in, in a violent conflict. And of course, that means talking about other civilians too. Um, my family went on this journey and encountered so many people that made it bearable for us to, to be on this journey. 
um, and I'm eternally grateful to to some of these people for sure. I might highlight just a couple of individuals. Um, there's a there's a woman in the book that I describe whose name is Luba, uh, without whom I think that week uh, when we arrived for the funeral uh, would have been uh, completely unbearable. She. Um, um, met us at the airport uh, and from that moment of meeting us at the airport she guided us through bureaucracy through um, all the difficult offices we had to go to she gave me her mobile number and said I could call her at any time during the day or night if I needed anything uh, what pieces of paper I needed to pick up she, she told me exactly where to go who to speak to I mean one thing that is important to remember is that we, we don't live in Ukraine uh, my mom um, wasn't really, but she was only back twice in all the time that she spent outside of Ukraine, and that was 17 years. Um, so to navigate that bureaucracy was really difficult, and without someone so supportive, so understanding, so sensitive, um, it would have been very difficult. Uh, and of course, this entire uh, story for me is about uh, meeting other people. It started off uh, with a text message I received on Facebook. <laughs> Um, I got a text message from someone I didn't know um, f that I figured out was working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, asking if um, I knew such and such person and, and then followed by my mother's name and her details um, and then saying, asking if we could get in touch uh, with them. And so I realized something must have happened to my brother. Um, I wasn't sure what exactly happened, but, but I knew something bad must have happened, right? So that was you know, an individual I immediately had a, uh, had a contact with. Um, and, and I understood that there's a whole, uh, you know, body of people who are involved in this conflict outside of the army, um, outside of the front line, outside of the immediate war zone. Um, but also meeting uh, soldiers outside of the war zone was important for me. So you mentioned uh, a soldier that I met, a, a former soldier, a veteran that I met uh, at the cemetery uh, once when I was looking after my brother's grave. Um, and, it, and it was really sobering to speak to him because I understood that this is someone who's clearly suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, who's not receiving any help at all, um, who's finding it extremely difficult to reintegrate into civilian society um, because nobody wanted to hire him because, um, um, because it's not so easy for veterans to find jobs. Um, um, and but, but who was also being... Um, potentially used by some of the political groups. He showed me a text message on his phone saying that he's been invited to a political rally um, because it's prestigious to have a veteran support uh, a particular political group, right? And that conversation in that space of mourning where both of us came to find some sort of peace uh, with that veteran was, was really important for me to understand um, how, the, how this war is affecting everybody in the society. I wanted to pick up on uh, one point in your response there, which is you know, a lot of these characters who, as we put it, accompanied you on your journey are also women. And you're a historian of gender. Um, and I kind of wonder, and obviously you're one of the people who's been mourning for your brother. And I, I kind of wonder how you think, but how does gender enter into this, this dynamic? You have a, a society that is, you know, grappling with war and the trauma that comes along with it and then you obviously have individuals who all have their roles in this society uh, that's at war what what's going on here for you how long have you got yeah. <laughs> uh yeah so men are seemingly very very visible right because they're heroicized they they are out there in their uniforms except we also have to remember that the majority of men are civilians they're not soldiers <laughs> And they also experience uh, conflicts. And those who are visible, we learn so little about them, as, as we've been discussing today. We, we learn just a part of that story. But women are almost entirely invisible uh, when we're in, in war stories, when we think about um, wars, whether that's historic wars or, or, or the specific war in the Donbass. Um, and 
if they are brought into the limelight, they are usually celebrated as helpers of men, um, civilians who are volunteers often, or wives, or daughters, or partners, and so on. Um, the reality is much more complex. Women, of course, are absolutely everywhere. They're extremely um, actively involved in this conflict. Um, there are service women uh, who fight at the front and who have to fight uh, also uh, the legal restrictions um, along with the enemy uh, um, at the front line. Um, until recently, most of the positions at the front line were not open to, to service women. Um, and so the, the campaign that the veterans launched um, ensured that a lot of these restrictions are lifted and now women can actually be uh, at the front li at the front line legally because they found themselves in a position when they were um, when they were um, um, in a semi-legal or illegal state as being registered as seamstresses or administrators uh, but actually um, performing the duties of a sniper or, or a combat fighter, right? And so if something happened to them, they, their families would not receive any financial help. Um, if they got wounded, they wouldn't be able to be treated in military hospitals and so on. So it had immediate effects on their lives, right? But because they started this big campaign, um, they were able to change some of the legislation. So that's absolutely fascinating. They also united into a, a large veteran movement. Um, and and there's, a, there's a lot of volunteers like Luba that I described who are very actively involved and who, um, who have such a profound effect on, on the various uh, processes in this war, but whose work we do not see because it's invisible. And again, I got to find out about these people mostly by meeting characters, by meeting uh, uh, these uh, women face to face and developing friendships with them. And one of the most important uh, f figures here is Maria Berlinska. Oh, she, she has a chapter dedicated to her in this book. Um, uh, the friendship with whom was very important for me to um, to to deal with my brother's loss. Um, but also to understand the larger context of the war. Um, and she was actually the one who explained the situation at the front line for women, for service women to me. She was behind this big campaign that I mentioned. But she also brought my, my brother's bag from the front line when, um, when we were in conversation with his commanders, uh, trying to find out how they can post his belongings to us. She said, well, actually, I'm not far. I'm going to go and pick it up and bring it to you. And then we ended up uh, on her kitchen uh, floor going through his possessions and deciding what could go to volunteers uh, on what we can keep just a few sort of things to remember him by and all of all of this is run by women but we don't know their stories and I really wanted to bring some of these stories into this book I want to talk about the end of the book um, at the end of the book you you have a letter to your brother um, and it's a very powerful ending one of the the final paragraphs in that letter, you you know you kind of attack this a series of groups that you believe are profiting or benefiting or keeping the war going, whether it's warlords, uh, whether it's people involved in the contraband business, whether it's politicians, whether it's international community, and then you have this response from a priest which because the whole thing is taking part part of this letter is framed by this confession um, that you're having with the priest and he responds it sounds like you really loved your brother i don't really have a question but i wonder if you want readers to take away one thing about this book what would it be wow um that's a difficult question one of the aims for me writing this book was to battle my own demons and hatred, I think, that appeared in me, which I've never experienced before in the same way, but which appeared in me with my brother's death was definitely one of those demons. And, and it's the feeling of hatred, resentment, like you said, towards those who actually profit from this war. And of course, here we can talk about the Kremlin. Without the Kremlin's involvement, none of this would have happened. We 
can talk about some of the people who profit on the ground as well, who know that if they don't bring those drones, for instance, that the diaspora collected money for and bought and sent to the front line, if, if they sell them, for instance, you know, so we talk about corruption in the army, someone will die. <laughs> but they make those, someone will die at the front line because they will be doing the job of a drone like my brother did. Um, so yeah, uh, it was very difficult for me to overcome that resentment. And I knew it was a perfectly natural feeling to feel, but I also knew that it was consuming me from inside. So writing about this was one way of dealing with it, because I think that this war is going to finish uh, sooner or later, I hope sooner rather than later, but we will still have these difficult feelings to grapple with. And as a society and as individuals, we need to find ways of overcoming them. We need to find ways of talking to each other um, after having so much blood, so much loss, uh, after experiencing so much pain. And I'm not sure how it's going to happen. And I know one way for certain, um, um, I, I know that one thing that, that has to happen is some sort of justice as well, because I think it will be very difficult for people to speak to one another without seeing that justice uh, has been done and that war criminals have been punished. Um, but still, in, internally, we need to find ways of finding some kind of peace. What do I want the readers to come away with? Um, I think probably that which I always wanted to explain to my students, that wars are fought by humans, uh, they affect humans. This is not about numbers, this is not about some kind of uh, abstract uh, forces, enemy forces. We have so many euphemisms that we use, and, and, and in Ukrainian as well, there's, there's, there's these words, two hundreds, which mean um, uh, a fallen soldier, three hundreds, an injured soldier. You know, we make it easy, easier for us not to uh, confront the reality by replacing, uh, by, by finding these euphemisms uh, and, and finding this language. But I guess I want us to remember that it is about humans, that it affects everybody, uh, the whole society, and that it has very long-lasting effects. Um, and that we need to be honest about them, and that we need to talk about them. Uh, we need to talk about grief, we need to talk about trauma, um, and we need to talk about it together, collectively, and honestly. Well, I'm really glad the book is out, and I'm really looking forward to seeing it out in Ukraine at some point in the future. Uh, it's called A Loss, the story of a dead soldier told by his sister, and it's out now with Ibidem Verlag.